certainly a lot from God's word that we have to say, and so we sometimes are reluctant to go through too many preliminary factors, but certainly we would be remiss and irresponsible if we didn't take the opportunity to say thank you to the congregation here at 39th Street. Thank you so much to all of the elders. Appreciate them so very much for the work that they do in serving God and shepherding this flock. Always very appreciative of the, the invitation that we get to be able to come here and labor with this congregation. You guys know very well that this area is very near and dear to the hearts of my family and me. And our first workout of preaching school was in this area, and that's where we met so many of the wonderful Christian faces that we see today. We've loved you guys so very, very long, and, and we just hope that we'll be able to continue these relationships right on into eternity, be able to be with one another forever one day. Love you guys so very, very much. Appreciate the hospitality that you guys have shown to us, all the hard work that the ladies have put in down in the kitchen to make sure that we're physically nourished. Appreciate so very much the fine hospitality of Jack and Lana on yesterday, on uh, Sunday, or Monday that is, and we just enjoyed ourselves together, being able to socialize and catch up a little bit. Jack has even lended me his truck to be able to drive around on this week, and so that just shows you the type of fine Christian individual that he is. The only problem with that is you're probably going to have to arm wrestle me to get that thing back uh, from me a little bit later on tomorrow, man. I, it's a nice truck. I've enjoyed driving it, so man, I might just drive that thing home instead of flying home tomorrow. So Jack, just heads up, man. Get your get your arm wrestling ready to go. <laughs> Appreciate it so very much. Two point four billion dollars. Is that figure mean anything to you that is the revenue that was generated in the fitness industry in the United States of America in just the first three quarters of 2020 now if the number 2.4 billion dollars is not impressive to you certainly the number 2020 is because we remember that's the year that our country and most of this world was introduced to the corona 19 virus and even whenever that pandemic begins to ravish our world, our country is still that dedicated, that devoted to physical fitness and exercise. $2.4 billion and the year wasn't even over yet. And so that just kind of tells us again that people are into exercise whenever you go into any commercialized gymnasium in our country, especially on Monday afternoons, it seems like that on on the weekend i guess people do all of their bad eating they have all of their cheat days over the weekend and so come monday everybody wants to try to get off that extra piece of cake that extra bowl of ice cream they want to get rid of all of that stuff and until so you go into a gym on monday afternoon and you probably probably going to spend more time waiting on a machine than you are actually working out for the day because the place is going to be absolutely replete with people jam-packed but we think about rigorous types of training and it's not a concept that's new to us is it think about the greeks and their obsession with physical fitness in a scholarly journal and an article that was written by lance c delic and lynn kravitz during the article entitled the history of physical fitness they write perhaps no other civilization has held fitness in such high regards as ancient greece the ideal of physical perfection is one that embodied ancient greek civilization the appreciation for beauty of the body and importance of health and fitness throughout society is one that is unparalleled in history. And again, if you know anything about the Greeks, you know that that is true. This is the birthplace of the Olympic Games and, and all of these types of things. And so we know that they really devoted themselves a lot to physical fitness. Well, you look at Timothy, the book that we're going to examine tonight, the passage of Scripture comes from the book of 1 Timothy. And of course, we know that 1 and 2 Timothy are two canonical books, books inspired by the Holy Spirit, by the Apostle Paul, that are written to Paul's son in the faith, Timothy. And when you look at Timothy, we know that Timothy was a Greek. The Bible will let us know. In Acts chapter 16, verses 1 through 3, whenever the Apostle Paul and Silas and Luke and others embark upon a second evangelistic mission, the Bible will tell us that they would go into the regions of Lystra and Derby and the southern region of Asia Minor, where they had been on their first evangelistic mission. You will remember in chapters 13 and 14 of the book of Acts, they had gone into Asia Minor, Paul and Barnabas and, and others with them. They had proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ there for the first time. Uh, to the glory of God, there were many people that obeyed the gospel of Christ. There were congregations that were established. 
in Antioch of Pisidia, Iconium, Derby, Lystra, and they had it in their mind that they want to go back to those regions to be able to encourage and exhort the souls of the brethren that were there. And so they do this. And, and once they come to Lystra and Derby again, the Bible says that they come in contact with a young man by the name of Timothy. This man was young man was well spoken of in that particular area. Luke tells us a little bit something about Timothy's heritage. He said that he was a son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but the Bible says his father was a Greek. And so not only this, are we told in verse number one that his father is a Greek, but when you get down to verse number three, we find out again that Luke tells us that his father was a Greek, and that's in the context of Paul taking Timothy and circumcising him. Because they're about to go and begin to embark upon further missionary journeys or evangelistic missions. Paul wants to take Timothy with him. He wanted him circumcised because they would go into a region where there were Jews, and the Jews knew that his father was a Greek, Luke tells us. And so when you think about that, we glean a lot of information about Timothy, don't we? Not only do we know that he was part Jewish, part Greek, but we know that Greek, the Greek part of his heritage probably was prevalent in his life because as a young man, the Bible says he wasn't circumcised yet. Paul took him and had circumcised him. And so what that probably means, what we probably can deduce from that is that the influence of his father in his life was great indeed. And so I think that means something to us as we move a little bit further into the text in just a moment here we look at paul's relationship with timothy and of course that would begin a relationship that would cover a span of about 15 to 16 years and off and on throughout that time they would function together in the gospel of jesus christ as father and son paul often affectionately would refer to timothy as his own son in the gospel or in the faith of Christ. And so these two men become very, very close to one another, and ultimately their relationship will culminate, again, in these two letters being written. I heard one of the brothers say just a moment ago that probably 2 Timothy was the final letter that the Apostle Paul would have written. And that's exactly right, based on what Paul himself has to say in chapter, chapter 4, verse number 6 through 8 of the book of 2 Timothy. And so again, their relationship culminates in these letters being written. Whenever you study 1st and 2nd Timothy, one thing that you'll find out is, again, it's a personal letter that Paul is writing to Timothy, and there's a lot of things that he's got to say in the course of that letter that are personal for Timothy. They are bits of information, they are instructions that Paul, a preacher older in the faith, is given to Timothy, a younger preacher in the faith. And so there are some things that we see there that are preacher-specific whenever Paul is writing to Timothy. We know 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 2, don't we? Preach the word. Young preacher, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. In the book of 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 3, Paul tells Timothy, As I besought thee to abide still in Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to genealogies or fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edification which is in Christ, so do. And so these are our instructions that he's given to Timothy from the vantage point of a preacher. Sometimes when Paul speaking to Timothy, he gives him instructions that are youth specific. First Timothy chapter 4, verse number 12, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example in word and conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. And so as a young man, Paul has given him instructions of how he ought to conduct himself in the house of God. That's what the book is really all about, isn't it? First Timothy chapter 3, verse number 14. Timothy, these things I'm writing unto you, hoping to come unto you shortly. But if, you tarry, if I tarry long, that you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar on the ground of truth. And so Paul is telling this young man how he ought to conduct himself as a minister of the gospel. Sometimes he tells him things that are young male specific. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. What does he tell Timothy the preacher? He says, uh, rebuke not an older man, but entreat him as a father, and the older women as mothers, and the younger men as brothers, and the younger women as sisters. And so this is information that is given to him, that again, that is very particular to the fact that Timothy is not only young, but he is a young male laboring among the Ephesian congregation. Well, with that in mind, once we go over to 1 Timothy chapter 4, I certainly cannot help but to think that perhaps the analogy that Paul utilizes in the, the unit of thought that's under our consideration on this afternoon is one that Paul uses with Timothy's culture and his background under consideration. What does Paul say there? Verse number 7 of 1 Timothy chapter 4, but refuse 
the Bible says, profane and old wise fables. But exercise, or and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. So we're going to analyze these two verses on this afternoon, but not only these two verses. We'll back up to around verse number one, and we'll grab all of that because it pertains to what it is that Paul had to say in these two verses, and then we'll get into the two verses that proceed or proceed those verses once we get to the conclusion of the lesson in order to get the, the whole thought, the whole flow of what it is that Paul is saying. But again, Paul may be talking to Timothy in regards to the fact that here's a young man who was a Greek. And he uses an analogy or a metaphor that is something that Timothy might be able to relate to because of who he is, because of where he comes from. Exercise meant something to them. And what does all of this mean to you and me? Well, what it means to us is this, is we also live in a culture that is very fitness driven, very exercise oriented. People are concerned in this country about how their bodies look. They're concerned about physical beauty. They're concerned about health and all of these types of things. Concerned about getting bigger where muscles are concerned. Concerned about getting smaller perhaps where weight might be concerned. And so we, we can relate to what it is that Paul is saying here. This analogy does not escape us. We understand what it is that Paul is trying to emphasize. And so the item that Paul wants at the top of his son in the gospel's priority list is not bodily exercise that is culture extolled above all else, but exercise under godliness. The type of rigorous training that our Heavenly Father extols above everything else. And that is really is the gist of this particular text. We look at bodily exercise. And of course, he's going to tell us that it profits little. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But he says, comparatively speaking, then there is spiritual exercise. And in the mind of our Heavenly Father, who is infinite in his wisdom, who is omniscient in his knowledge, who is omnibenevolent in the love that he has for us, he says that you need to understand that this particular type of exercise is much more important to you than this over here. He's not saying that bodily exercise is not important. We know that it is. But he's saying comparatively speaking, relatively speaking, exercise under godliness ought to take precedence in our lives. The word exercise that we see in verse 7 and verse number 8 is the word uh, gumnatse in the Greek language and gumnasia. And so gumnatse is the, the verb that's used in verse number 7 where he tells Timothy to exercise yourself and what that word literally means is is rigorously train yourself train yourself unto godliness again the word gymnasia is a noun and it means the the uh, act of physical exercise or, or rigorous training and so we want to make sure that we understand that at the outset of our lesson whenever I study a text of scripture one thing that we always try to do is to be involved in the process of exegesis. And of course, what exegesis simply means is to pull out or to lead out of something. And so all preachers ought to be involved in some shape, form, or fashion, at least to some degree, in exegesis. Because the Bible, this is God's Word. This is where our salvation comes from. James chapter 1, verse number 18, of His own will begat He us by the Word of Truth that we might be a type of first fruits of His creatures. Verse number 21, Wherefore, lay aside all filthiness, and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. So the power, my friends, is in the gospel of Christ, Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16. The power is in the word of God. And so we ought to be involved as preachers and teachers of God's word and as Christians in general in the process and the exercise of exegesis leading out of the text. What is there? And whenever I analyze this particular text, here are some concepts that I see. Number one, obstacles. We're talking about exercise here, right? Talking about exercise. And as we talk about it, one of the concepts that I see in this text are obstacles. Number two, a second concept that I see here are priorities. And then thirdly, all of us can relate to this who are into exercise in some shape, form, or fashion. The third concept that I see here is results. Results. And so we're not trying to superimpose anything upon a text on this afternoon. We want to simply extract out of this text what God, the Holy Spirit, has put there. And so these are things that are there. If you don't agree with me, then just, just hang on for a minute. Let's work this thing together and you'll see that what we're saying is exactly true. The first thing that we need to be concerned about where exercise is concerned is our obstacles. And that's exactly what we see in the text. When we talk about physical training, most Physical fitness gurus will tell you 
that there are three things predominantly that will derail or become an obstacle to you accomplishing your physical fitness goals. Those three things are these. Number one, stress. Number one, stress. Stress produces in the human body an enzyme called cortisol. And what that particular enzyme does is it, it disrupts the process of protein synthesis. Everybody knows that in order to build muscle, protein synthesis has to take place. Protein is the building block of muscles. And so that cortisol is released in the human brain whenever stress occurs. And so they'll tell you, if at all possible, try to, to not be as stressed as, as perhaps you might be. Try to find things that curtail the stress because it will help you to be able to accomplish your physical fitness goals. The second thing that you see there is lack of sleep. Lack of sleep. Uh, those who are in the realm of physical fitness are finding now that one of the most advantageous things to being able to accomplish physical fitness goals is being able to get a good night's rest and nothing will derail it quicker than not being able to get sleep so lack of sleep number two and then number three a poor diet a poor diet my son and i gabriel we decided that uh, toward the beginning of the summer that we were going to have a, a ab contest an ab contest and so both of us are are fitness guys we like to lift weights and do all that type of stuff but both of us are big guys and 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 you know it's been a long time since i've seen any type of of, of six pack or 12 or anything like that hadn't seen that in many many years and so i thought well you know we love competition and so this compete with one another let's compete with one another he was wanting to get more physically fit he's wanting to get more trim getting ready to go to college play a little bit of football so so i said let's help each other out let's let's have this contest at the end of the summer we'll look at each other and we'll see who's got the abs who's got the better you know whose abs are showing off a little bit better well we've never after after summer was over we never got together and really took a look at that and i know it really just wasn't any point on my part <laughs> because as good as it sounded to me uh, my, my diet simply will not allow that to happen. And so I love to lift weights. And I'll get in the gym and lift weights all day long with you. But when it comes to turning away that cake, man, it's hard for me to do. When it comes to resisting my wife's buttermilk pie, I just cannot do it. When it comes to turning down that ice cream, it's so very hard to do. And so my diet disrupts what I'm trying to accomplish goal-wise where physical fitness is concerned. But that's generally the biggest obstacle that people face where exercise is concerned. Well, guess what? Nothing is different. When we talk about spiritual exercise, that's the analogy that Paul wants us to draw here is physical exercise compared to exercise unto godliness or spiritual or religious exercise. Eusebia is the word in the Greek language, godliness there. And it talks about religious uh, piety or devotion we ought to be exercising ourselves in this particular arena even more so than exercising ourselves in this particular arena but paul wants timothy to know from the very outset that there are things that will disrupt spiritual exercise or exercise under godliness look at what the text has got to say we back up to verse number one now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits Pardon me, in doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their consciences seared with an hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats that God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them that believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, the book says, and nothing to be refused if received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now notice what Paul tells Timothy next. He tells him first and foremost, in the latter times, there are going to be false teachers. You are going to have to contend with false doctrine. Paul wasn't the only one that points this out. Peter pointed it out. In the book of 2 Peter chapter 2, Jude points it out. In the epistle that bears his name, our Lord Jesus Christ, before he left this planet, will point out that we needed to be aware of false teachers who come to you as sheep, but they are wolves in sheep's clothing. And so it's a problem in the church. And God is concerned with the church exercising itself unto godliness. But guess what, friends? There are some things that will disrupt that exercise. There are some things that will become an obstacle to us becoming the godly, the spiritual giants that God expects us to be. The first thing on the list, Paul says, is false doctrine. False doctrine. He says in verse number six, if you put the brethren in remembrance of these things, 
Thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up, the Bible says, in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained, but profane and old wives' tales. Uh, refuse those and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Now, when you look at those two imperative statements, imperatives that you have there, verse number seven, number one, refuse profane and old wives' fables. Number two, the second imperative there is exercise yourself unto godliness. Splitting those two is what is called in the Greek language an adversative particle. And what these things do is paint these two things in juxtaposition. In other words, if you want to be able to accomplish one, you got to be able to do away with the other. And when it comes to old wise fables, when it comes to profane doctrines, Paul tells Timothy that you've got to be able to remove that obstacle from, from the congregation where you're laboring. Remember, that's the first thing that he told them in chapter 1 and verse number 3. That you in Ephesus, that you might charge some, that they teach no other doctrine. If we want these people to exercise themselves unto godliness, if we want them to become spiritually fit, we've got to get the false doctrine out of there. Got to get it out of there. Sometimes whenever you read things in the Bible, and you study them in depth, and it causes you to chuckle just a little bit, that word wise fables there, old wise fables there, literally comes from a term in the Greek language which means old womanish myths. Old womanish men now, sisters, don't get mad at me. That's what Paul said. All right, that's what Paul said. That's the words the Holy Spirit chose, but that's what it literally means is, is old womanish myths. And we understand what, <clears throat> what is being talked about here. You know, most of us uh, remember our grandmas. I remember my grandma in Oklahoma, and man, she had some old Old, old myths. You know, didn't really hear the guys talking about these things, but I hear, would hear her and some of her friends talk about these things all the time, like, like splitting the storm with an axe. You remember the, that, Brother Rick? And Brother Rick's from Oklahoma, too. I don't know if that's an Oklahoma thing or what. But, man, she said there'd be an axe out there in the yard, and it'd be sticking, the, the, the head of it would be down in the ground, the handle would be sticking up. Anytime any of us grandkids got anywhere near that axe, man, she'd be hollering at us, get away from that axe! Get away from that axe. You couldn't touch it. And finally, we got old enough to ask, well, what is the axe there for? Well, it's, it's put it there to split the storm. Okay, okay, whatever. <laughs> to, to, to split the storm. So the, as the old myth goes, whenever a storm is, is coming, you know, say from the east, it's coming. If you put that axe there, then it's going to split the storm and it'll miss your house. It'll go all around your house. And, and so <laughs> I think Paul probably had something like that in mind. But the funny thing about it is this. These false teachers in the congregation of Ephesus, that's how Paul describes their teaching. What did they think that they were? Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1 real quickly and you'll see who they thought they were. Whenever Paul tells Timothy to, to charge these guys that they teach no other doctrine, don't be involved in all of these fables and endless genealogies and all these things. Look what he says in verse number 5, down to verse number 7 in particular. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart, of a good conscience, and of faith and fame, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. That's another way that he describes their false doctrines. But listen to verse number seven. These false teachers, they desire to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. They thought that they were teachers of the law. They thought that they were big and bad, scholarly teachers of the law. They were something Paul says you're involved in old womanish fables, old womanish myths. And so that was meant to, to gig at them, to, to really to help them understand what their teachings amounted to. And the same is the case with any false teacher in the church today. That's all that their teachings amount to if they will not teach the truth of God's word. God is interested in us exercising ourselves unto godliness. He's interested in us building up, becoming strong spiritually. And there's an obstacle to that that is prevalent in so many different congregations today, and that is false teaching. And so Paul says we've got to get those things out of the way, just like where bodily exercise is concerned. Unless you get the obstacles out of the way, the stress, the lack of sleep, the poor diet, you're never going to be able to accomplish the things that you might want to be able to accomplish where physical fitness is concerned. Man, I love 2 Timothy chapter 2. Go over there real quickly, and you see that... The Bible works together in beautiful and perfect harmony. Isaiah taught us to build line upon line and precept upon precept. And so you remember what Paul says over there. We need to be exercising ourselves under godliness. He's teaching us, Timothy, that there are obstacles to that, namely in this particular unit of thought, 
false doctrine. We'll go over to 2 Timothy chapter 2, see if Paul says anything different over there. Verse number 14, he says, of these things, that is the thing that he has just taught Timothy, put them, that is the congregation that you're laboring with, put them in remembrance of these things, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearer. We know the next verse, don't we? Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Notice verse number 16. But profane and vain babblings shun those, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. What is 1 Timothy chapter 4 concerned with? Exercising ourselves unto godliness. What is the obstacle? False doctrine. Go over to 2 Timothy. You see the exact same thing. Shun profane and vain babblings. Shun false doctrines because they will increase not to more godliness, but to more ungodliness. You're going to go backwards. The doctrine is not pure. My friends in the congregation, you're going to go backwards. I'm trying to exercise. I'm trying to, to perhaps get bigger, put on a little bit of muscle. I want to gain 10 pounds of, of lean body weight. Guess what? If I'm not getting the sleep that I need to get, I'm going in the wrong direction. If I'm not consuming the diet that I need to consume, it's conducive to me going in the wrong direction. My friends, if I'm stressed out, then it's going to be adverse to what it is that we're trying to accomplish. And so the first thing that we see in the text are obstacles. Obstacles. The second thing that we see in the text where exercise is concerned are priorities. And so when we get, we get into verse number eight, Paul wants Timothy to understand where the priority, a lot, where the priority lies. Pardon me. Again, here is a young man who was Greek in culture and in ancestry. And so there's no doubt in my mind that he would have understood a lot about exercise. Matter of fact, in that same article that I referred to just a moment ago, didn't read all of it, just uh, an excerpt from it, but later on in the article, they get into talking about how that fitness was a part of every school's curriculum in, eight, in, in ancient Greece. And so just as important as was their math, just as important as perhaps was their philosophy, just as important as was their reading or anything else, was exercise. They say that was right there at the very top of the priority list where their daily uh, schooling was concerned. And so Paul no doubt knows that about Timothy. He wants Timothy to make sure that he understands for himself, for himself, for his own sake, but also for the sake of the congregation that he's laboring with, that there is a priority above that. There's a type of exercise that is more important than physical exercise. Any personal fitness trainer will tell you if you intend to accomplish your fitness goals, exercise will have to become a priority. They say it like this. It needs to become a way of life. It needs to become a way of life. At times, people set out to accomplish fitness goals. Maybe, like we said a moment ago, losing a little bit of weight. Maybe gaining a little bit of weight, depending on who you are and what you're trying to accomplish. But they'll tell you that you need to make this a priority in your life. It needs to become a priority. It needs to become a way of life. You need to fit it into your schedule like you would fit other things into your schedule that you are committed to for the day. It needs to be there or else you will not be consistent. But when that thing becomes a part of your life, like getting up and eating your breakfast, perhaps getting up and reading your Bible, getting up, having your devotional with your family, not saying it's on the same level with those things. That's exactly what Paul is saying that it's not. But at the same time, if you want to be able to be consistent, things are going to have to be a priority in your life. It's important as other things that you commit to in the day. Now, again, in Timothy's culture, bodily exercise was a priority. But my friends, in the culture of Christianity, exercise under godliness is the priority. And so we need to make sure that we understand that. That's what Paul wants Timothy to understand, to comprehend. That which is of, was of the most uh, utmost importance to the Greek was less important uh, was less important than exercise in the godliness. And, and again, that's something that means something to us. It's a matter of, again, when you look at the language here, it's a matter of oligon, little in the Greek language, versus panta, everything. And so those are the two words that you see in verse number eight that are so of so much importance to us. For bodily exercise profits, oligon, little, little. We'll talk more about that term in just a moment. But godliness is profitable unto panta, all things. And so what the idea is here is you need to look at your life, analyze your life. You need to understand that there are some things that are, are middle in life. We don't understand that sometimes in this American culture, do we? 
Sometimes we got our priorities all out of out of place because we only focus on one small component of life. You know that word panta again, it means each part of a totality. So when you take something, the whole of it, every single part of it, that's what the word encompasses. That's what the word entails. Every part of it, not leaving anything out. Again, so many people are, are so secular in our world today. So many people are so worldly minded. that They give no thought or consideration to the bigger part of life. Guess what? One of these days, my friends, we're all going to enter into eternity. We have a soul, the Bible teaches us, that is eternal, that is immortal, rather. And so when you think, comparatively speaking, to the time that we spend on this earth versus the time that we will occupy in eternity, doesn't it stand to reason that things that will make for our well-being in eternity, that those things ought to be of a higher priority than things that only pertain to this particular life? It only stands to reason. It only makes sense. And that's what Paul is trying to impress upon Timothy and those of Ephesus with this particular unit of thought. The brevity of physical existence versus the reality of eternal life is what is under consideration here. My friends, how many places in the scripture are we informed as to the brevity of this physical life? And you go back to the Old Testament. Job talks about it, doesn't he? Job chapter 7 and verse number 6, he describes his life as swifter than a weaver's shuttle. Going over to chapter 9, verse number 25 and 26, that same book of Job, he describes his, his life metaphorically as being as swift as a runner, as swift as a ship or an eagle that hastens to his prey. He says life is here for one moment and it's gone the next. We look in the book of Psalm chapter 39 and verse number 5, and what does David write over there? In regards to the brevity of life, he says, Behold, God, you have made my, my days and my life as a hand breath. He says, You've made my years like a hand breath. And he says, my life is as nothing before you, or the years of my life, rather, the length of it is as nothing before you. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vapor, the Bible says. If you don't understand what that means, go over to the book of James. Chapter 4, verse number 13, and James comments upon that same type of concept over there. Go to now you that say that today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, live there for a year, buy and sell and get gain, whereas you do not know what will happen on tomorrow. What is your life, James asks? Is it not a vapor that appears for a oligon or a legon? The same word that James uses in, in James chapter 4, verse 14, is a word that Paul uses over here in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 7 and 8. Same word. Your life appears for a little while, and then it vanishes away. And so we need to make sure that we prioritize things based upon the truths that Paul is divulging in this unit of thought. We think about the eternality of the soul or the immortality, I think is a better, more accurate way to say that. The immortality of the soul. Does the Bible speak to that as well? You better believe it does. What about places like Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 22? Heard a good brother quote that verse a little bit earlier on today. As the Hebrews writer is talking about the superiority of the sacrifice of Christ. He begins to make a comparison between the Old Testament sacrifices and the sacrifice of Christ our Lord, that was efficacious to be able to take away our sins. But he says that where sacrifice or where human life is concerned, it is appointed unto man once to die. Christ only died once. He only died once. Why? Because he was a human. It's appointed unto man once to die. But it's the next part of that verse that I want us to consider. After we die, it's not the end of the subject, my friend. The Bible says after that is the judgment. After that is the judgment. We can deduce from that scripture that once life is over here on earth, it's not over. We continue to live on in immortality, the Bible teaches us. In John chapter 5, verse number 28 and 29, Jesus Christ is talking to the Jews on that particular occasion, and he says that God has given him authority to judge, and he's given him the authority to dispense life. He says in verse number 28, marvel not at this. Don't, don't be surprised that God has given me the ability to give life. Don't be surprised that God has given me the ability to dispense judgment. It says, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which that all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Christ says, you are coming out of the grave one of these days, every last one of us. And then we face eternity. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 and 12. John is given a glimpse into the final day. 
at the end of the book of Revelation. He said he says that he sees a great white throne and him that sat upon it, before whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was no place found for them. And John says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before the Lord. And the books were open, and another book was open, which was the book of life, and the dead were judged out of the things that were written in the books. John says that the dead rose. My friends, whenever we look at life, life that we live here is relatively brief compared to eternity. Paul says we need to choose our priorities accordingly. That's what he's teaching his son in the faith here. We need to make sure that we understand the same thing. And then thirdly, we look at results. When it comes to exercise, we need to be aware of the, of the obstacles because they're there. Whether we're talking about physical exercise or spiritual exercise, obstacles are there. In the second place, we need to consider priorities. We need to be able to make spiritual exercise a priority in our lives. Number three, the results. See, nobody engages in physical fitness without the anticipation of results. Brother Mornay, is that right? You know, Brother Mornay is a weight guy too, a weightlifting guy too. And I'm telling you, whenever you go to a gym, they got mirrors all over the place for a reason. Because people are looking for results. They're looking for results whenever they're, they're bench pressing and whenever they're doing curls, they want to be able to look in that mirror and, and look at the bicep to see if I'm doing any good here. So people are interested in results, man. The, the ladies, you know, they might go home and get in the mirror and man, pull the shirt up and see if they, they're losing anything at that waistline. They want results. That's what we're doing this for. When it comes to spiritual exercise, nothing different. That's what the text teaches us, nothing different. Results are what we're looking for. Again, verse number eight, for bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable, my friends. There are some results from godliness or exercise under godliness. It's profitable unto all things. Having the promise, remember we talked about the word panta, it says it includes all things, all of the components of a whole. Well, what are some of the components that are under consideration here? Well, Paul summarizes it. Having the promise of the life that now is and of that, which is to come. Everything that God has got in store for us, all of the results that can possibly derive from spiritual exercise, the Bible says they're available to us. Don't you love that? Don't you love that? The results are these. You got the promise of the life that now is. Christian friends, are you living a beautiful life? And we've heard on this week that sometimes life has challenges. Sometimes there is chastening that we've got to contend with. Sometimes there's persecution that we have to deal with. But at the end of the day, does any of that rob us of our joy? Man, it sure better not. If it is, then you're not doing something correct. Paul was in prison when he wrote, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Him being in prison in Rome did not rob him of his joy that he had in Christ. He, there's nothing that can take away the fact that Christ is our Messiah. There's nothing that can take away the love that he has for us. Romans chapter 8. There's absolutely nothing that can rob us of forgiveness of sins if we're walking in the light. 1 John chapter 9. There's absolutely nothing that can take, us, take away from us our avenue of prayer whereby we communicate with our God. There's nothing that can take away the promises that Christ made unto us that if you seek first my kingdom, my righteousness, every other thing will be added unto you. There's nothing that can take away from us, my friends, the hope of heaven. Not even the false doctrine that's bearing this ugly head in the brotherhood today. Can't take away the hope of heaven. It's just lies. Jesus Christ teaches us. He's coming back again one day. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Brother Jeff, he's going to receive us unto himself. We're going to meet him in the air. Thus shall we always be with the Lord. He told his apostles, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. For in my father's house of many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. What place was Christ going to? What place is under consideration? Earth? We've got some of our brother in teaching now that we're going to spend eternity on this earth. Is that where Christ was? Is that where he was going to, rather? He's going to heaven, my friends. Many times the Bible teaches us that Christ, once he resurrected from the dead and ascended, he's in heaven at the right hand of the Father where he is that's where he's preparing a place for us that's where we get to go when this life is over if we live faithfully paul did it's timothy did we're looking for results we're looking for results 
where bodily exercise is concerned, the results are relatively small. Again, that's the term that Paul uses, a league on. In significance, it means small. In quantity, it means few. Where time is concerned, and that is the context here, is time. It means briefly for a little while. And all that weight that you lift in that weight room, Brother Mornay, and I've lifted weights with Brother Mornay before. He's a horse, man. He can get it in that weight room. It's only going to benefit us for a little while. Just for a little while. See, Jeff over there, we're about to come to a close here. But when I was a kid, I used to like bodybuilding a lot. So we saw guys like, you know, when I was real young, Arnold Schwarzenegger was still doing it. Then you had Lee Haney who would come along after him, break Arnold's record. Arnold had seven Mr. Olympia titles. Lee Haney comes along and blows that up, gets eight, and that record still stands. Ronnie Coleman tied it uh, about a decade and a half ago. And so you got all of these guys. And I would look at it. They would come on Saturday mornings. They should show these things on TV. And so I used to watch it. I'd just be enamored with what I saw and how much muscle these guys could put on their bodies. But here's something I want you to think about. Whenever you Google any one of those guys, Phil Heath, any of these professional bodybuilders, they will show you pictures of these guys. Now, I do not I encourage women to do this, but guys, you can do this because of the modesty issues. But you Google these guys, you see pictures from a very brief period in their lives. Shows them when they're in their heyday, when they're big and when they're 285 pounds and 2% and body fat, and muscles all over the place. They show you those pictures. They don't show you pictures of these guys today. Why? Because bodily exercise profits just for a little while. Nobody want to see Arnold Schwarzenegger with his shirt off today. Nobody want to see that. <laughs> all right? Nobody want to see that. <laughs> just for a little while. Man, he once had the most beautiful male body on the planet. But nobody wants to see him with a shirt off today. Because bodily exercise is just for a little. It's got results. The results are fascinating, but however fascinating they may be, they are, are only temporary, my friends, when it comes to exercise under godliness. Not only does it have a promise of life that now is, which we've already talked about, but it also has a promise of a life which is to come. The results will be eternal. Brothers and sisters of Christ, if you will exercise yourselves under godliness, the results will be eternal. Final thing Paul says in this unit of thought is this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation. What I'm telling you, you can take it to the bank. I love that about Paul's writing. What I'm telling you, you can take it to the bank. A faithful saying is the truth, worthy of all acceptation. Let's accept it. Appreciate your attention.